Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Thankful once again to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the air, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had been looking at the first paragraph of Romans chapter 5. Just had just got into the, the fifth chapter. We've looked together. Uh, if you followed this series of videos, we've looked together at the total depravity of man and the total inability of man to remedy his condition. And then the marvelous grace of God for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace. And I pointed out how many people have, have only emphasized the first part of that phrase. Uh, there's a long sentence there, which is only a fraction of a sentence. It is our God who by his grace justified us without a cause. And then we, we reach then uh, the grand climax, the 25th verse uh, of the fourth chapter. He was delivered because of our offenses and was raised again because we have been made righteous. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, what profound truth as we open the first few verses of the fifth chapter. We've been justified, therefore, having been justified, it's an aorist passive in the original grammar it's been done. It isn't being done. You've been made righteous. You aren't being made righteous. You won't. It's not that you, you'll eventually be righteous. You have been made righteous by the obedience of Jesus Christ, as, as we'll see when we read verse 19. In addition to that, you have guaranteed peace with God. God's at, not at war with you. Uh, you have peace with God. And more than that, you have access into the greatness of this grace. And that access into God's grace by means of or through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access. And the word have there is a perfect in the Greek, which the perfect stresses the fact of a past completed action where we are rejoicing in the present reality of that past completed action. Whether you think it's right or not, whether you believe it or not, or, or whether you exercise it or not, you absolutely have access into God's grace. It isn't something in your life will prevent that. I mean, not only do you have access into that grace, you rejoice and you rejoice in the certainty of glory with God. This is where we're at, pretty much where we're at in our text, in our study here. In chapter 5 in the certainty of God's glory and in the true as I pointed out the true estimation of Christ's value or his worth which is what the, the word glory means it's an easy thing to become so wrapped up in the garbage that surrounds your feet that you fail to realize that you can rejoice in God's glory his glory and not only that, you rejoice and boast in tribulation, in affliction, because you know that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, 
and that it is God who is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. I pointed out uh, numerous times that God w will not allow anything to touch your life in any way except it be for your ultimate good and for his glory. And now we're being shown that the Holy Spirit has put God's love in our heart and our love for God. You know, you see that that's the great problem with much of modern Christianity. It's all man-centered rather than God-centered. And I'll, I'll, I repeat again that I would a thousand times, 10,000 times, a million times, rather have you tell me what God has done for me than tell me what I should do for God. It is the Holy Spirit who has put God's love in your heart. And it is God who has given you the Holy Spirit, the earnest of that inheritance. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 6. Over the years, my my conversation with Christians is it's kind of gone, you know, basically something like this. You know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, do you believe that he died for your sins? Absolutely. Well, do you believe that he was buried and he rose again? Absolutely. Without question. Well, do you believe that you're justified by faith? Absolutely, if, if I'm faithful. Do you agree that Jesus chose his disciples? Yes, I believe that he did. Well, do you believe that we have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? Um, well, I'm not so sure about that. Do you believe that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ? That when the Father looks at us, he sees us as righteous as his Son? Absolutely not. I mean, where did you get that idea from? Do you believe God calls us saints? you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? I've never called myself a saint. I won't call myself a saint. You seem awful proud to me. Sounds sort of prideful to me. Well, what about sin? Do you believe God has forgiven us all our sins, past and future? Well, no, I can't really go along with that, Steve. Uh, past, yeah. Past sins, yeah. But future, no. Well, how about eternal security? Do you believe once saved, always saved? Well, now I've really struck a nerve. Oh, you haven't bought into that lie, have you? I mean, so... It, oh, okay, so you're trying to keep yourself saved then. Absolutely, aren't you? Well, no, I'm not. I have been redeemed. Well, after all, you have to suffer for the sins that you've committed... Now, now, wait a minute. I mean, where did you get that verse? And it, this is kind of how it goes. And, and I'm astonished. In the 30 years I've been teaching this book, I'm astounded how far Christianity has moved away from doctrine. Oh, doctrine. Doctrine's divisive. There are people, folks, who died for what Christians today consider to be insignificant. You can almost hear the Holy Spirit cry out, Oh, Timothy, take heed unto doctrine, for in doing so, you'll save both thyself and them that hear thee. The Christian church is rapidly departing from doctrine 
to where that they can join in agreement on everything, you know, refusing to confront the great percentage of doctrine that people used to die for. I've been, I've been severely criticized for some of the things I've said about Romanism. It, it, because I believe it blasphemes my Savior. And I, I would die before I blasphemed my Lord. When we were without Christ, di he died for us. The word without strength there, you could translate that sickness, but it's properly translated no strength in the original text. That's the doctrine of total depravity that Christians died before they denied. Modern Christianity almost fully preaches that redemption is based upon the action of the individual. One could almost paraphrase it, that God has done everything that he can do and the rest is now up to you. And I say, where is there any biblical basis for such a conclusion? I've, I've seen so-called Christian banners that said, printed on a banner that said, decision determines destiny. And it's one of those things where they had no, you, you didn't see a scripture reference tagged, you know, at the bottom of it. In John 3.3, 3, the Lord Jesus Christ declared that the natural man cannot see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord's own words. He didn't say they shouldn't enter. He didn't say they dare not enter. He didn't say they could, they could enter. He said in verse 5, they cannot. And the word there is, is dunamai. They, they have absolutely no power to enter heaven. No strength, no power. In John 6, 44, and also repeated in, in, in 65, the Lord declared that man cannot come to God. No one, no one, no man, no one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, that's drag, and I've heard a thousand sermons on the, the radio and tapes and TV, and I've read articles and magazines that if you just come to Christ, he'll change your life. And the word says, man cannot come to God. And right here in this epistle, Romans 3, verse 11, we read, there is none that understands there is none that seeks after God. We saw that in chapter 3. God came to man. Adam didn't go looking for God when he sinned. Adam's sin did not drive him to Christ. It drove him away. And it was God who came looking for Adam. And who, by the way, very kindly and graciously announced his presence so it wouldn't scare him half to death. And I don't know how many sermons I've heard from preachers trying to scare people into heaven, scaring people into accepting Christ. Folks, Christ is not a fire insurance policy. Man cannot come to God. He has no ability to come to God unless God forces it. In John 8, 44, the natural man cannot hear the word of God. And yet a thousand churches preach as though the natural man can hear it. My Bible says he cannot hear the word of God. I am very accustomed to the, the King James Version, the authorized version in John 10, my Bible tells me that the natural man cannot believe. John 10, 26, 
but because you are not my sheep, you refuse to believe. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now I get messages, email after email. Steve, are, do you really believe in eternal security? Do you really believe? I, and I hear message after message preached that says goats can hear and become sheep, and, and sheep can revert back to being goats, and sheep have to keep themselves saved. The doctrine of eternal security is wrangled and wrestled over as if there is some great complexity to the issue when Jesus settled that issue in one straightforward sentence that began and ended with one breath. And people wonder why I stand amazed at all of the ignorance and the deception. The problem, folks, is people are simply not taking God at his word. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, Steve, I know I read that, but, but, and as soon as I hear that word, but, I shake my head in disbelief. Why do you not believe me, said Christ, because you're not my sheep? Amazing. How many Christians have rebelled against the statements of some of the early theologians that regeneration preceded belief? Of course it does. Unless you are one of God's sheep, you cannot believe. That's what this book teaches. It, it is God who regenerates, not you. Jesus himself said, if you are not my sheep, you cannot hear or believe my word. The condition, then, is to be a sheep. Some time ago, I was driving with a brother, and you know, and he said, now, now let me see, you said... You said that a goat never becomes a sheep. And then all, all I heard, all I heard, all the way to where, from where we were going was the wrestling, the, the rustling of his Bible, all the way from Monroe, Oklahoma to Hot Springs, Arkansas, trying to find verses that would prove to me that goats become sheep. And he finally said, I give up. Folks, you are God's sheep. You were born that way. By God's grace, not by anything that you did. In John 14, we're told that the natural man cannot receive the word of God. He cannot receive it. In Romans 8, and we'll get there, Lord willing, in our study, the natural man cannot please God. The natural man cannot please God. And one of one of our nation's leading evangelists was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, several years ago. And one of these, one of the lead men took me out to lunch, and I read that verse to him, and he said, Well, what that verse says is a natural man cannot please God except when it comes to accepting Christ. Folks, I think that's adding to the Word of God. And I think that that denies John chapter 10 that says that you have to be a sheep before you can accept. Where do we, where do we get these ideas? We get these ideas because we depart from doctrine because emotion is a lot more fun emotion is a lot more exciting and emotion is a lot less work and we spend most of our time singing about things that are 
well, most of the time, theological trash. It's amazing what you can put to verse and music and, and make it sound good. But it may not be theologically sound. I'm not suggesting that doctrine is fun, but I am saying that God has told us to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we're told that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. And in Romans 8.8, 8, we're told that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And with all of that doctrine, how is it that the modern Christian church has so dedicated itself to cleaning up the old man rather than declaring the grand truth of God's grace? That when we were totally depraved, when we were without strength, at God's appointed time, in due time, his time, Christ died for the ungodly. The word time there is not chronos, it's, it's kairos, it's God's appointed time, not a time of man's choosing. And if we somehow try and merge the two, as some do, God's timing and man's timing, like they, sort of like they bumped into one another, then we have a major theological problem there as well. Because we, we have now suggested that man's fallen, unregenerate will somehow aligned itself, a dead man's will, aligned itself with God's perfect righteous will apart from the work of regeneration, which if that were the case, man would have had to already been regenerated. And, and that's precisely how that works. Regeneration comes first. God wants you to understand that new birth was something that you didn't have anything to do with. New birth precedes faith. Then you believed and acceptance. And that is what modern Christianity fails to understand. That's what they do not understand. <clears throat> what do you suppose it was like when, when Peter stood up in Acts and said, by the determined counsel and coordination of God, you by wicked hands have taken and crucified Christ. Did they have a choice in that? Well, one could argue that they had a choice, but believe me, it was God who decreed before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would die to redeem me, me, who was without strength. And I want to tell you, that is good news. In God's appointed time, not when man decided to do it. I've heard very interesting Bible studies that, that when you look at the theology of the day and the intermixture of mythology and, and the uh, the religions that were present, it was a good time for Christ to decide to come and die. Listen, listen, folks. The death of Christ was decreed before we ever got to be created. It was in God's appointed time, not man's. Man had nothing to do with it. In God's appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's not leave the verse. The word for there is you pair. Who pair is the word in the original text. He died in the place of the ungodly. The offense of the cross 
is to rely on God, and there's nothing in me that is godly or pleasing to God. You can't find a verse, not one single verse. You cannot find a verse of Scripture that would support anything the natural man does would be acceptable to God. The Scriptures declare that even his worship, that his work is sin. The plowing of the unrighteous, I've pointed this out before, the plowing of the wicked, the plowing of the unrighteous is sin. They that are in the flesh cannot, cannot, cannot please God. At God's appointed time, Christ died in the place of the ungodly. It is inconceivable that if Christ died in your place, you can die. You do not need any other verse of Scripture to rejoice in the certainty of your relationship with God if Christ died in your place. If he died in your place, you cannot die. It's just that simple. And yet we wrangle over it. Once saved, always saved. Yes or no. To believe a Christian can lose his salvation is to ignore, reject, or abandon the very first primary elementary principle fact of the Christian's life, and that is that Christ died in our place. Stop and think about that for a moment. There isn't anything that you could do. Do you use up the grace of God? I couldn't count the number of times over the years I've been accused of preaching that a Christian can do anything he wants to, anything he wants to do, and still go to heaven. They usually phrase it like, uh, you know, what blasphemy? Are you saying a Christian can sin all he wants and, and go to heaven, Steve? Absolutely. Absolutely. I am saying that. I'm, I'm sinning more than I want to right now. Now. I doubt that there is many a soul listening to me now that would admit that. Well, perhaps some of you would. Well, I'm not quite sinning all I want to. Come on. I'm sinning more than I want to. Or I am not redeemed. One of the great things that I look forward to is eternal fellowship with my Lord when I'll never sin against my Lord again. And I know that in this earthen vessel I sin. But I know I don't want to with my mind. I serve the law of God and with the flesh the law of sin. He died in my place. I could never use it up. I could never spend all the grace of God to close the door on the access which I have to God's grace. He died in the place of the ungodly. Bear in mind, the ungodly. That means that there is no merit in me. Not one single one of you is redeemed because there's something in you that, that makes you or made you preferable over somebody else. It is not what God saw in you that brought about your redemption. It is what he saw in Christ. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isaiah 53, 11. When one is born from above, he is born from above by the will and the action of God. Go back to the Passover. Go back. Reread the Passover, folks. It wasn't anything that the firstborn son did. He didn't do anything. Didn't make any difference whether he thought the blood on the doorpost and the lentils was going to work or not. It didn't make any difference. Made no difference. 
Don't worry, son, you won't die. I, I put blood on the, the doorpost and the lentils. Dad, are you sure? Are you sure you did that? Are you sure about that? The firstborn didn't die. His belief had nothing to do with it. It had everything to do with his salvation. It had everything to do with his peace, his salvation. If he believed what his father said, he would have slept like a baby. It had nothing to do with his regeneration. But by believing, by believing, he could rest in the provision of what his father had done. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He could rest in the provision of what his father had done. If he didn't believe it, he could stay up all night biting his fingernails, worrying himself to death. but he would have awoken alive. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Timothy, take heed unto the doctrine. That's the way that you deliver yourself and those who hear you. Are you delivered from the fear of death? Are you delivered from the works of the law? Are you delivered from the great burden of carrying sins that God's forgotten? And I tell you, most Christians that I meet are not. Because they're not taking heed to doctrine. God has nothing against you. You don't face a purgatory. You don't face the great white throne judgment. To be sure, at Bema, you'll give an accounting for the talents that you have, but that's not judgment. God is a God of love. You are centered in that love. And you have the Holy Spirit, who is the earnest of that inheritance. Where are the Christians today who have the peace that passes understanding, the joy that's unspeakable, the, the confident realization that he always triumphs, that he, God always causes us to triumph, and that we always have the victory? God doesn't say, if you do this or that or the other thing, you'll have the, the victory. You have the victory. You have it. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, in Christ. He didn't say you're going to be blessed with all spiritual blessings. Not going to be. You are. If God, in his wisdom and in his grace, has brought pressure and affliction and trial and hardship in your life, it's for your good, your ultimate good, that his grace and glory might be revealed in you, and cannot God do with you as he pleases, so that his glory and his grace might shine through. When God says he works in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure, I was reading a letter from a, a minister who said, who said, never, never, when a young child dies, ever use scripture to comfort the family. That's what he said. He, he said to speak some platitude, like all things work together for your good, to a family uh, who's just lost a young child is cruel and inhuman. That's what he said. You got to be kidding. It is the word of God, folks, that ministers peace to me, that ministers rest, that ministers joy. And some of the, 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 some of the gushy, gooey poetry doesn't. I mean, it might bring an emotional high, but it doesn't bring a lasting peace. You know a God who, when you were totally unable in yourself to do anything, died in your place because he loves you because you're his he, he paid a price 
for you that is beyond human comprehension. Why would he pay such a price and then just forget about you? Just, just cast you away. Oh, Steve, y'all know, but I can see what he did with Paul and Peter and Daniel and Abraham, but, but me, who am I? I'll tell you who you are. You are one for whom God paid all he had. He gave all he had. God has declared in his word he will never cease to sustain and uphold you that he has ordained the way that you take and when he has tested you you shall come forth as gold I believe Satan loves it when we avoid or ignore doctrine and Satan loves it when we labor to, to the best of our ability and work the best we can to earn God's favor I believe Satan loves that. The last thing he wants is for us to take heed to doctrine where that our labor springs forth from love, where that our labor springs forth from rest, where we find ourselves working because we've been so blessed. The believer's life, is, as well as the body of Christ, is governed by the principle of grace which produces results for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die But God commends his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The word joy there, if you're using the authorized version, the word joy there is our word boast again. Boast in the God. It's it's the God by means of our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation the word there is katalasso restoration to favor precisely Christ exchanging his righteousness for our guilt I give you my righteousness and take upon myself your guilt. Stop and think about that for a moment. The innocent Son of God taking upon himself your guilt and in exchange for that guilt giving you his righteousness. That is our boast. Not in what we did or what we are doing or a view toward what we must in the future do. And he did this while we were yet sinners. When we were yet without strength. In due time. His timing. Christ died for the ungodly. That was us. That is no longer us. A word ungodly, impious, irreverent, wicked. That is no longer us. And he now calls us saints because 
He has made us saints because we've been made saints by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. I want to thank all of our followers of these videos, verse by verse videos, and I thank you for all of the messages that I have received, the messages of, of encouragement that you've given me and sent me. I appreciate all of your prayers. I love you all. I truly do. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I, I just, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, by means of his shed blood. We come into your presence by means only of Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful once again for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. We're just, I just ask that you would take and strip away all foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for listening.